All right, welcome to Early Care Connection. Uh, I'm Izzy Greenberg. Today, we are joined by our resident panel of experts, Meryl Gay from the Connecticut Early Childhood Alliance and Ava Bermudez-Zimmerman from the Child Care for Connecticut's Future campaign. We, of course, have uh, Sandra providing interpretation, which we are so grateful for. Uh, and then just a reminder to everyone uh, to speak slowly enough for her to interpret accurately and without too much stress, uh, just as much a reminder to me as anyone else. Um, I would like to remind everyone to use the chat for conversation between the community or to uh, tell us about any technical difficulties. But if you will have questions for our panelists, please put those into the Q&A. That's the right spot for those. Okay, we have a lot going on this morning. We are going to start off uh, with Commissioner Bai and the Care for Kids team. Uh, we've got stuff about DCF. There's a lot to talk about here. I am going to actually make things simpler and turn it over to uh, Commissioner Beth Bai, who will um, kind of introduce the order of operations this morning just to, to keep things concise. So uh, Commissioner, welcome. Thank you so much for being here, uh, for bringing your team, and um, of course, always being open to communication with this community. So welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Izzy, and thank you to you and Marilyn and Ava for keeping this going. It's super important that we have ways to communicate, and um, it's not always cheery news. Today, we're here to talk about a challenge that we're having at OEC that's impacting all of you, um, and also here to answer your questions. But to provide information to you so you can understand uh, what's happening, we've had a number of changes in care for kids, including bringing in... Um, uh, families from DCF. So DCF is here today to work, talk to you uh, with our team about how that's going and who's covered and who's not. There's definitely some confusion there. Also, um, we've got United Way here, our partner in processing, and um, they're going to talk about where we are with processing care for kids applications with real-time data. Um, we'll even have better data in a couple of weeks, so we could have waited, but we felt like the pressure here to understand what's happening and the impact on you and your programs um, was too important to wait two weeks. So um, we felt like we had to bring this to you now. We're open to hearing um, from you and also just want to be really transparent about the data as it is. Um, and uh, and say, as I said at the legislature, it's not okay. Uh, we're doing everything we can to to fix it. We're hiring more people to, to help processing times. We're working overtime and weekends. Um, and I guess the good news is when you compare it to 2019, instead of 15,000 families, we're approaching 20, uh, 15,000 children, we're approaching 20,000 children, uh, which is a good thing um, because we, you know, it's a huge growth in the system, but with growth sometimes come growing pains. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Dodanowitz, who's um, uh, a manager of our child care and development fund uh, process, which is part of how we fund care for kids. But those are all the rules that we have to follow with care for kids. So, um, Kristen, you're going to facilitate the rest and then I'll be back uh, for questions. Uh, so hopefully you find this helpful and, and we're here for questions afterwards. OK, Kristen, take it away. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, good morning, everybody. I am Kristen Dedanowitz. I'm the CCDF program manager here at OEC. Um, and I just wanted to take the opportunity first to thank the Early Care Connection for having us on this morning to give an update um, kind of on all things care for kids. So I am actually trying to share my screen so I can pull up the presentation if that's okay, Izzy. Yep, you should be able to. All right, let me see. Can you guys see it in presentation mode? Yes, uh, we're actually seeing the your your mode. We're not seeing just the one. Oh. We're seeing all three three no. squares. Oh boy, I'm sorry. I don't know. No problem. I don't know how to get out of this. That's um. <laughs> let's see. Go to display settings at the top. That may help. I just have the task oh, bar. Oh, there right. we go. Display settings. Um, Presenter view and try that one. There we go. That's it. That did it. Perfect. Is that better? Yeah, okay, perfect. Got it. Apologies for that, you guys. Um, so we have a team here from 
our CCDF team, we have Laura Dunleavy, Julie Bisai, Charmaine Evans is on the line as well to help us answer some questions. Um, we are still waiting on our partner from DCF to join. I think he's having a little bit of trouble getting in. So if we get to his slides, I can um, just kind of pop in and, and help out in case he is not able to get on in time. But um, again, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for giving us the space this morning to um, give you all an update on all things Care for Kids. Uh, we do know that there is a lot of frustration right now in the field in terms of, of processing and the wait times and delays and things of that nature. And we do just want to take the opportunity to reassure you all that we are working very closely with our partners at United Way um, to make sure that we are, you know, addressing all of the concerns and doing our best to work to get to um, a steady state where we are determining cases timely um, in the best interest for all of you and for the families that we serve. Um, so I just want to be transparent that we are aware um, of kind of what you guys are doing now. And we are very open to hearing all of your questions, concerns, and we want to be as helpful as possible this morning um, for all of you. So we are going to take we're gonna kind of go through these slides, I think pretty quickly so that you all have an opportunity to um, ask questions and really kind of understand what it is that's happening and so that we can understand kind of what's happening on the ground so that we can do our best to make sure that we are um, addressing your needs. So really quickly first, we want to start off with an update regarding protective services. So this is legislation that passed last year, last session um, that allows the commissioner of the of early childhood to class. Um, so that is a federal allowance that we are allowed to do. So it is something that the state decided that we wanted to take advantage of um, to prioritize at-risk populations. So the three populations that are listed in the current legislation are children placed in a foster home by DCF, um, adopted children for one year from the date of adoption, and homeless children and youths that meet the definition of McKinney-Vento. Um, and I am going to toss it over to my friend, Laura Dunleavy, who is gonna go through um, some of the eligibility requirements for those pieces. I just want to flag, there's a lot of text on these slides. We are happy to share them. Um, and I can also put a link to the policy transmittal in the chat that is available on our website. So. Don't worry if you don't have an opportunity to take notes on these, we're happy to share and can provide um, the slides afterwards. So I'll toss it over to you, Laura. Great, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, I'm Laura Dunleavy. I'm an ed education consultant with the Office of Early Childhood and I'm a part of the CCDF team. And so what does this legislation mean for everybody? Well, what it means is that these three protected services groups are given the highest priority for processing. So these families will not be put on a wait list and our team at Care for Kids um, works closely with these families. They have a dedicated staff that are working to prioritize them and complete their applications. So this slide talks about eligibility. So really what the protective services legislation does, it allows us to waive certain eligibility criteria for these families. So it makes it easier for them to come onto the program and stay on the program. So well, I have two slides that I'm gonna to speak to. Um, eligibility for the whole protective services group is very similar. There's just a couple different nuances. So we're gonna talk with the foster and adopted children through DCF. Um, Ted um, Stanford hopefully will be joining us and can speak to a little bit more of our partnership, but we are working closely with the DCF team. And I think what's really important for everyone here to understand is that DCF is actually submitting the applications um, directly to care for kids. So when a foster family or an adopted family are working with DCF, they need to work with their caseworker to complete the application and then their caseworker submits it to care for kids. That just makes the process quicker 
um, and in within that process, it's stamped and approved by DCF. So again, that just really expedites things. So providers out there, if you are working with these families, you know, make sure that the family is connected with their social worker to get the application processed. So how we look at the family unit, it's a family unit of one. So we're really just looking at the child. Um, we are able, part of the piece that we can waive on a case-by-case -case basis is the income eligibility. So we do not collect pay stubs um, from the families. They're not required um, and there's no income determination. Um, and again, if the family isn't working, the activity piece is also waived. So if a family member is not working, we would grant a maximum of a half-time certificate for care. If the family is working, we're gonna base the um, level of care on what's declared on their parent provider agreement. Um, we also are able to waive the asset limit. We have a million dollar asset limit on the Care for Kids program. We don't have to have any kind of questions related to that. So really what's required? That they submit a completed Care for Kids application, that it's been reviewed by DCF, and it's given to care for kids. And also included in that is their parent provider agreement. So Kristen, if you could just go to the next slide. So the other, the other group is children um, and, and families experiencing homelessness. And again, the, the eligibility is completely the same. There is no income requirements. There are no activity requirements. A maximum of a half time um, certificate is given to families who are not participating in activities. And the only difference with this group is that there is an attestation form that the family would need to sign and submit along with their completed application and parent provider agreement. Um, so that is it. And now I think I'm turning it back to Kristen. Thank yeah, thank you, Laura. Yeah. Um, Kristen, can I just clarify one thing? Yes, I'm please do. Listening. So both for DCF and for families that meet the McKinney-Vento definition of homeless, there is automatic eligibility. They don't have to fill out all the pay stub information, et cetera. I just want to be super clear on this. Correct. They don't need to submit income eligibility or um, verification of an approved activity. Being in protective services, qualifying for one of these three categories is considered their activity. And awesome. um, per the federal requirements, we're allowed to waive income on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, so each case is looked at separately, um, but that is something that we're able to waive, yes. Super, thank you. Sure. And, and, and what about, can I ask one other question? What about the wait list? Do they go, they skip the wait list and go right to eligibility? So that, that's, okay. That's what yep. I thought. I just want to be really clear on those two points. Thanks. Yep, no problem. And we will be a little bit more specific on the wait list too in, in just a couple of slides for who goes on, who doesn't go on. Um, so thank you so much, Laura, for that overview on eligibility. Um, previously, prior to protective services, families who um, were experiencing homelessness received a 90-day grace period to submit documents to care for kids. Um, to make it streamlined and easier um, for both the United Way staff and parents and providers to understand the requirements. We extended that 90 day grace period across all protected classes. Um, so foster adopted in the first year and then families who meet the definition of McKinney Vento will all be able to um, have this 90 day grace period, which allows parents a little bit more time to provide documentation on immunizations um, and any other eligibility determining documents that have to be submitted to Care for Kids. And I'm not sure if Ted was ever able to get in. Um, is he, do we know if Ted Sanford is in at all? I still haven't been able to see him in the... Okay. I, I, yep. I don't know. I, nope. That's okay. No Some, worries uh, at all. Additional instructions. I'm not sure what is going on. No worries. Um, so we have been working very closely with Kristen. The let's department. Just, maybe while you're talking, Julie can reach out. Julie Jaconi can reach out to DCF to. to yeah, I, I did send him a Teams chat 
um, but I have not heard back yet. For anyone, they can just also go to earlycareconnection.org and you can sign up there if you didn't get, if you didn't for, for some reason, uh, or you can, if you, you can chat me his email and we'll, we'll try again. Maybe there was a mistake. Okay. Um, no problem. And just for time purposes, I'm going to keep us moving. Um, so this really has been a huge lift, um, protective services and DCF payments, which, um, I will get into in just a moment, but it's been very important and it is very important for us to highlight the partnership that we've created with DCF, um, us here at OEC, United Way of Connecticut, and also Deloitte, our partners who, um, work on the impact system and do a lot of our um, changes in the on the technology side. So we um, have been sorry, I've got a pop up. Um, we have identified a transition plan. So what this means is we broke into three phases the different. Um, kind of cohorts of, of children that would need to be rolled into the Care for Kids program who are already in DCF care. So protective services went into effect on December 1st, 2023. Um, and on December 1st, any new children, any new children to the Care for Kids program who meet any of those three protected classes applied as protective services and were able to um, you know, kind of bypass some of those eligibility requirements and um, get into the program a little bit faster. United Way very strategically created a separate unit within their um, within their eligibility services um, staffing, and they have a dedicated staff who only do protective services eligibility cases, um, which does help expedite the process for for this group. Um, so with any Care for Kids case, depending on when the application is received, Care for Kids can approve up to 15 days prior um, to the application receive date if the child was already in care. Um, if the child was not already in care, the eligibility date would have been December 1st for that cohort of children. Um, the second phase that we implemented were children who were already on Care for Kids, they were already in the system, already receiving benefits, um, and they needed to be transported for payment purposes from DCF to Care for Kids. Um, so what that entailed was us making sure that we had a separate call out on remittance notices that the providers receive to break out exactly how much was paid for DCF, but it is outlined on the remittance notice that is received by providers for Care for Kids. Um, and Sherry, I don't know if you can remind me the, the specific title that's of that column in the remittance notice. I think it says all other agency payments. Um, that is where you where providers will be able to see the amount that was paid to DCF for that invoice period. Um, so that transition began on January 1st, pulling over all of those payments, switching over the payments from DCF to Care for Kids for that existing um, group of children that were already on Care for Kids. The third group is children who are in DCF care, but not on Care for Kids. Um, that could have been for a multitude of reasons, whether the parent did not qualify previously because they weren't working, they were retired, they weren't in an approved activity, um, all of those kind of qualified or disqualified the parent from receiving benefits before. Now, because the activity is not looked at, those families can be grouped into the Care for Kids program. We know that there were about 800 children who fell into this category so the transition for this um, is, is still happening. It was delayed a little bit, to be very honest with you all. Um, it did not begin on February 1st. I think um, we actually just started it maybe about a week ago. Um, but the plan, we are still on track for April 1st to have all of those certificates effective April 1st. Um, and 
DCF will not be making any payments for childcare after April 1st. So there is a transition period that DCF is still responsible to pay um, childcare. Oops. Oh, hold on one sec. Uh, Sandra uh, just shifted. Let me. Yeah, it kicked me out for some reason. And All right, I let me fix it. I have to come back in. Yep, no Thank problem. Sorry. Fix it. Just one second, guys. Sorry about that. Sure. No worries. Hmm. Something, yeah, something weird just happened with interpretation. My apologies. Hold on. Okay, I think we're good to go. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Izzy. Sure. Um, so there are cases that DCF is still responsible to make payments on. And that would be, so previously DCF was paying on what they called a WAF. That may might be a familiar term um, to parents and providers. When Depending on which cohort these children fell into, DCF is cutting off their payments at a certain time and transitioning over to care for kids. So if you have a current child who receives foster um, payments or foster child care payments or adopted child care payments, um, my advice to you in terms of who to reach out to first would be the DCF caseworker. And then... Um, then you can reach out to care for kids to see, you know, kind of where that falls. And if there's no success in reaching the DCF caseworker, then I would advise you to reach out to care for kids who has, um, you know, relationships built with those caseworkers and the staff over at DCF who can help you get the answers that you need. Um, but April 1st is kind of like that magic date where the anticipation is that all child care payments for DCF will be made by Care for Kids. Um, so we ask for your patience in this transition. I know um, it can be, and probably is for providers, very confusing. Um, we understand that we're doing the best we can to stick to the timelines and um, that you see kind of outlined here in this slide. There are some technology issues. There's, you know, us learning about DCF, DCF learning about OEC and United Way and kind of how all of our systems can play together um, to make this as seamless as possible. But please, you know, don't hesitate to reach out with questions. Again, I recommend first reaching out to the DCF caseworker um, if payments seem to be delayed. Uh, payments on the Care for Kids side, we are, are very, very good. Payments are made almost 100% within 15 days, the date the invoice is submitted. And Sherry can, you know, elaborate that a little bit if, if she feels necessary. But um, if you are not receiving that DCF payment, and you think that you should have, please reach out to DCF, and then care for kids. And, and we'll work with you guys to make sure that that is rectified on our end. Sherry, I see you came off mute. Is there something you want to add? Nope, just want to say yes. Uh, yeah. Once an invoice is submitted, they are turned around extremely quickly. Yeah, we, and we appreciate your team's work there and I'm sure providers do as well. Um, so I am going to move on to the next slide here and I'm gonna throw it over to Julie Bisai on our team who's going to explain a little bit about um, the enrollment management wait list, who goes on, who doesn't go on, where are we at? Um, so Julie B, take it away. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Good morning. Uh, so our enrollment management waitlist has been in uh, been live since last March, March 1st of 2023. So we've had one year of the waitlist. Um, on a weekly basis, we invite about 250 to 300 families off each week. Um, the families who don't go to waitlist directly are our protective services, as Christian just mentioned. Uh, families that are on TANF or had been on TANF in the last five years. Uh, families participating in JFIS, usually connected to TANF, and then teen parents. The families who do go on waitlist are the parents working, making less than 60% SMI at application. Um, and so what our priority group for the employed, our parents in the workforce programs or certificates, the newer um, priority groups of workforce 
uh, the higher education and our GED programs. Uh, so those those families are moved to waitlist upon receipt of application and processing to determine um, if they're in the other groups, the TANF or JFIS, or if they're in the working or workforce. Um, for, as of today, or actually as of in February, um, we have 744, uh, it's showing 722 from that date. Right now we have 744 families as of this morning on the wait list that are, you know, will be, will wait the um, seven to eight weeks before they will be invited off the wait list. So the processing time um, and the intentional delay in wait list in order to stay within the budget. So it's, it's shifting the 12 month eligibility by those uh, two months. We yeah. also have another 1300 that have been invited off and are in process or waiting for their missing information, et cetera. Um, next slide, if there is one. Maybe not. Um, so that really the, the pro, okay. So the process is on, on a daily basis, uh, Sherry's team at United Way is inviting 50 to 75 families off every day of the wait list. So they would be, you know, it's kind of offset when their application would have been received uh, six to eight weeks prior to that, the date that they're being invited off. Um, Perfect. Thanks so much, Julie B, for that, thank you. For that update. Um, I want to apologize for the technical issues that we're experiencing on our end um, that that kept DCF from being able to join. But I do, um, I will put Ted's name in the chat. He is somebody, if you have any questions that you can reach out to on the DCF end, and he can get you connected with the proper person um, at on their team who can help answer specific questions. Um, so I will put his name and his email address in the chat for those who are interested in it. Um, and I think, Izzy, that brings us to the end of our presentation if we want to open up for some questions. Yeah, sure. And I wanted to just um, uh, guide you guys back to the chat also because there are some folks who have put some um, comments. I know it's confusing where you put comments versus questions, but there are some comments in the chat um, if folks, you know, if your team can can look at those because it, it looks like there was some, you know, some, this might not be what's happening on the ground for families. They're being asked to submit payroll work information. Um, so, you know, will payments be retroactive? There's a lot of information in there. So just want to um, point you guys to that. And if you can uh, type in some answers, that's probably helpful. Let me go to the Q&A. Um, yeah, I know some of them came up in the Q&A and I think we've answered a couple of them, um, but I just want to give this before I throw it over to Sherry Sutera at United Way to talk about the processing. I just wanted to give space for some specific DCF questions. Um, but, but I can, or okay. if you want, if you want to throw it over to Sherry, we can have Sherry go and I can address some of the questions that are here in the chat. We have, if you want to, um, since we've got a lot to cover today, um, maybe we'll just ask a few questions from the Q&A and then we'll move to the next sure. part That's with perfect. Sherry. Um, yep. And then if there's questions remaining, you can answer them, the written questions. Absolutely. Um, okay, so um, if families are invited off the wait list and being told they're being processed, does that mean they will be receiving Care for Kids benefits? Sorry, one. Um, if families are invited off and being told they're being processed, if they've been invited off the wait list within 60 days, they can use that original application that was submitted. If it's after 60 days from the date of submission of the application, they would need to submit a new application. But the the communication from Care for Kids would tell them that. Sherry, is that correct? Uh, their eligibility date. Nope. So these are families, if they receive an invite off of the wait list and they're within their 60 days or outside of their 60 days, they are alerted if they're outside of the 60 days and need to submit a new application, correct? Yes. Yes. They will need to submit a new application if it's after 60 days because their original one is no longer viable. Can I ask but a question? In addition. Can I, can I just ask a Go. clarifying question? So we have processing delays. 
Are you saying if we have a 60 day processing delay, then the family needs to do everything over again because of our delay or uh, our, it's, our, it's confusing a little bit? It is a little bit confusing. And this is a regulatory barrier that we are up against. So our regulations specify that any app that applications are only valid essentially for 60 days. So after an application passes that 60 days from the date of submission, they would have to complete a new one. Re wait list aside, um, that would be any situation. Is there a way can to I clarify? Can, can I can I just finish this question? If there, and then clarify, if there is a way that the family can just check a box to say this is still accurate, is, is that possible? Right now in this in the parent portal, no, it's not, but that is something that we can explore. Okay, Julie, go ahead for clarifying. And for the 60 days for those waitlisted families, what we're looking at is we've been holding intentionally the, the really close to that 60 days, trying to keep them under the 60 days. There are some families that fall past that. So if the processing to get them to the waitlist took took longer and so they weren't in the group, but that, that should be really limited for the number of families who, who were, which is part of where we're keeping the waitlist trying to keep it under that eight weeks. So um, in addition, I think the question possible. also asked, go, go ahead. ahead. There you go. The, the other question I think was asking about if they come off wait list, if they're invited off wait list, it does not mean that the full application has been processed because United Way might not have had all the information to fully process to know if they're eligible. And about 60% of the applications that we receive are actually denied for mostly for income and mostly for work activity. So even though they're invited off the wait list, it's not saying that you're eligible. That's that's the next step to finish that processing and getting all the information. Okay, what, what I was gonna say is, so it seems like Julie, from what you said that we try to process in a way to reduce the parents needing to go back and redo the application and their ways we have to help reduce that. Correct. Yeah. We've been trying to keep really close, you know, from the beginning to, so that there are very few that hit past the 60 days. Okay. There probably were a couple, a couple bumps in the road where the processing time may have taken longer and they fell over that 60 day mark. And can I just use this moment to reiterate something, which is, have your parents do the parent portal because that gets all the complete information. And we have way fewer errors and way fewer requests for information, which are gumming up the whole works for everyone. So we had a high participation rate at first and now it's dropped. So anything providers can do to increase use of the parent portal, or if there are things we need to know that are reasons why you've stopped using the parent portal or stopped telling parents to use a parent portal, that would be helpful information to us because we find that it's all much smoother if the parents actually do it online because it makes them have everything in it before they submit. So the more you can do that, the better, correct? Correct. Oh, actually, uh, Beth, it is, um, it is true. It goes smoother and it is uh, a much easier application to process because it's entered digitally. But we do find actually uh, a higher percent of families when they submit in the portal are submitting less supplemental documents than when they put it in another packet to fax or mail to us. And I, I that might be client behavior because um, they can come back to it later and enter it. But if they're going to mail us something or fax us, they get everything together. So actually, um, we would like to encourage families to um, submit all of their documents. And when we talk about the status, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that where you can okay, see that mental docs. Okay. Um, I'm seeing Francesca wants to hear some of the chat questions answered. I, I would also just like to request that folks, if you have questions to please put them in the Q and A, it's just too hard for me to follow the chat, uh, to ask those questions. Um, certainly, uh, our guests can be reading the chat and answering them if possible. Um, it's really hard for me to pick them out as the chat moves along. So I'm going to go back to the Q and A for now. Um, and we will, you know, if it's not possible to monitor that, that would be great. Um, all right. Question. Next question. Why aren't working families, those at or below 60% state median income, 
not prioritized for the wait list? Don't they need the assistance to maintain employment? Yes. So um, the way we have certain categories of families that have to bypass um, the wait list. And, you know, as Julie B explained, those are the families in protective services, jobs first, um, families experiencing, um, I'm sorry, families who are on TANF and teen parents. So we have to work within a bit within available, you know, funding that we have for the program and within a certain caseload. Um, and unfortunately, it, the way that our priority groups are set up, that is kind of how we had to make the cut in terms of the wait list. But those families who are um, making less than SMI, the working families making less than the 60%, those are the first people to come off um, the wait list. Okay. Thank you. All right, Francesca asks, I would like to know if Care for Kids will pay the tuition that I charge for DCF Kids, which is which in Stanford is $465 for under three because I know that the max Care for Kids pays is $422 for under three. So Sherry, you said you wanted to answer this. So I'll I'll either send it to you or um, or others who may want to, to do this. Uh, I'm sorry, Izzy, I was reading the chat. Um, did they, what was the question? Um, is Care for Kids going to pay the tuition I charge for DCF Kids, uh, which is a little higher because I know the max for Care for, basically the Care for Kids rate is lower than what this person actually charges. And they're wondering if DCF is going to reimburse for, I believe the full rate of tuition or if they will max out at the Care for Kids rate. Uh, DCF does question. not max out at the Care for Kids rate. DCF tells the Care for Kids program how much that they approve. So DCF is the one that approves the rate. And behind the scenes, Care for Kids handles which part is Care for Kids and which part is DCF. Which is why we take all the documents from DCF. All the applications and PPAs are pre-approved by DCF. That's why they need to be stamped. So we don't need to go back and question the cost and the fee. So DCF will approve all the costs and um, behind the scenes, we decide which pot of money it comes from. Okay, will the Care for Kids payment be increased to cover the cost of the waived family fee? You want me to take that one? Um, so this one is kind of difficult without this going to- for super protective services, correct? I'm assuming because of the reference to the waived family fee. Um, so I think the, the, the quick answer to that is no. Um, but, and please, anybody on my team, if I am um, throwing I this one just, up. Just to, yeah, I'm thinking if there's no parent fee, then care for kids, the certificate would be the care for kids payment rate. Correct. Yeah. So it, yeah. And, and the payment rate would be the DCF approved rate. Um, so it should cover the full cost of care for that child is, is where I was trying to get to with that. So Meryl, thank you for your, your guidance in there and getting there faster than I would have. Hey, there's some longer ones in the Q&A. It's a little hard for me to answer or to ask that one verbally, but if folks could uh, look at the Q&A and answer some of those questions, that would be helpful. Um, sure. Let me keep moving. After they are removed from the wait list, how long does it typically take to get processed? I think Sherry will probably cover that when she goes into her Great. next slide. All right, we'll leave that one there. Um, the application would likely be after 60 days. Is there another processing delay on the second application or could there be? Yeah, so if, if a parent, for example, if a parent is invited off of the wait list and doesn't respond to Care for Kids notice within the allotted amount of time, the case will get denied. Um, in which case that family would then have to reapply and go through the same steps that they already did. Having to apply, they would have to be um, replaced on the wait list and then would have to wait the wait list time again until they would be invited off. So again, it's very important that um, we're working with families to ensure that all of the information that's being requested is submitted timely um, just because of the 
unintended consequences, I think, that come, you know, with not submitting it in the time frame that Care for Kids outlines on the notice. Yeah. Okay. You know, there's a lot of questions in here. Um, I want to make sure Sherry has time to present. Um, I'm going to go into, uh, actually, are, Sherry, are you next? I just yeah. want to make sure I'm getting the order of this right. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay, why don't you do that? And if if other folks on the team here could uh, answer some of these things in the Q and A in writing, that would be very helpful to clear them out. We'll do. Thank you. And then we'll go to presentation. Your share. We do see that, Sherry. It's working fine. Okay. You, can you hear me? We do. All right. Um, I just want to go over where we are currently with the processing status. So um, what I did was showed a little bit of historical. So you could see uh, the pending queue for applications, waitlisted applications, renewals, and supporting documents. So those are the the four buckets we'll, we'll call for care for kids um, for processing. So what we did was we showed the first of the month so you could see the progress we're making. And one thing we're really excited about with the influx of additional work and um, the addition of the protective services category and processing waitlisted applications, we worked closely with the Office of Early Childhood and we all decided that we needed to increase the resources available in the Care for Kids program to accommodate all these new um, components of the Care for Kids program. So uh, we did hire more eligibility staff and contact center agents and we're almost um, fully onboarded for eligibility. And I think that will show when you look at some of the numbers that we have here today. So just to show the difference, on December 1st, we had over 2,100 regular apps pending. It was taking us eight weeks to get to them. Um, as of today, this is hot off the press. There's 1,293 pending and we're four, and four, and a half, four to four and a half weeks out. Um, still four weeks out is quite a long time, but for us, when we look at cutting that processing time in half, and we're just continuing to make progress every week. We're really excited about that. And um, thank you, Commissioner Bai, for all the additional resources to the program. So approximately now we have around 1,293 pending applications. Those are applications that are first time applications to the program. They have not been placed on the wait list or processed yet. So um, once we dispose of those applications, they will either be granted denied or placed on the wait list. The number of applications pending from the wait list, so these are applications that were previously processed and then they were placed on the wait list. Then they were invited off the wait list, they were viable, so within the 60 days we use their, their, their previously submitted application. We currently have about 900 of those that are in process. Now, when we invite up in the order of processing applications, the very first things that we process in Care for Kids are anything that are priority one. So that would be our protective services. So those groups that Kristen had talked about previously and Laura, those um, we basically process those if they are flagged accordingly when they come in, we process those within about a week, right? A week to a week and a half, it takes to process a priority one application. And when an application is invited off the wait list, they are also bumped up in processing. So now with our current processing time of four to four and a half weeks to touching a new application, we actually move the wait list applications up in queue and they are processed before a new one that has not been touched yet. So basically it's less than four weeks when we redo a wait list application. Renewals, um, we're really making progress in renewals and March is a lower month. So we hope to continue to make progress there. You can see that uh, in December there was 1,350 pending and we are working back a few months um, from October, and November 
So as of today, there's less than a thousand and we are working on those uh, renewals that expire on the end of February. So those families are already in care. And so they will likely not have any disruption in care as we process the rest of their renewals. The big chunk that we're really excited about to have made significant progress on are supporting documents. Now supporting documents are all of those documents that hopefully would have come in with the initial application or redetermination or renewal. Those are your parent provider agreement forms. Those are your employment verifications. Those are your wage stubs. Those are any of the documents we need to process the case. So if they come in with the application or renewal in the same packet, which Commissioner Bai had talked about in the parent portal, make sure everything is attached. Or if you're mailing, uploading them via um, our internet, our website, or sending them to a, at a fax packet, it's really important that all those documents are in the same packet that come in. If they do not come in in the same packet, we then have to receive them after the fact and we have to attach them to the document. So the supporting documents in the past three weeks is where we've made real big progress and we've been deploying a lot of our resources. This weekend was Subdoc Saturday and Sunday. So that's all we did this whole weekend is to really um, pare down that supporting document queue, especially the PPAs, because we want to get them all done before any summer one comes in. So you can really see the progress there. In December, we had almost 8,000 supplemental documents that were taking us eight weeks to get to. As of this morning, we're down to 5,200 and we dropped down to five and a half weeks. Again, not ideal timelines, but if you can see the way we're trending, and we don't anticipate to lose ground, but only completely make up ground going forward now that we've unloaded those additional resources. Um, we're excited about that. So that can give everyone um, an idea. And this is again, just some of the, the, um, the definitions of what I had talked about. Does anyone have any questions about that? There are a million questions, <laughs> so I just want to yeah. uh, make sure that I want to make sure we can get through all the presentations, I think, and then maybe we'll go back to Q&A for the whole team, if that makes sense, Commissioner. I don't know. What do you think? I think that makes sense. Okay. I'm glad I'm glad there's been progress since I looked at this last week. So thank you, Sherry. It's still not acceptable. We still need to be faster. Um, um, I'm glad to see it's trending in the right direction. It might, it might be helpful, Sherry, to sort of, if we had a chart, you know, that could sort of show progress. And then I would also offer Izzy that we're happy to come back 30 days from now and, you know, show progress because, you know, we, we tend to come on once a year about care for kids and then like people are still really challenged. So um, I think maybe we just make a date for, Maybe not a month from today because we talked about something else on that date, but maybe five weeks from today and just um, be held accountable to making progress. You know what I mean? Great. Is there more presentation or should we go into questions now? I think that's it. Is that it, okay. um, Christine? Not from us. Yeah, that, that completes our presentation, Izzy. All right. All right, Meryl, I'm going to actually turn it over to you to ask uh, questions first because it's okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to turn it to you first. So um, there was some question about the answer that was given uh, regarding uh, the difference between what DCF has been paying for uh, spaces and what Care for Kids spaces. So the the question was from Francesca. She charges four sixty five per week in Stanford for infant toddler care and DCF DCF has been paying that, but Care for Kids pays 422. Will, if it's approved by DCF, will Care for Kids be paying at the higher rate rather than the normal Care for Kids rate? Can somebody yes. just yes. Okay. So wanted to clarify that. Now I know there have also been a bunch of questions um about um whether or not, well, a bunch of comments coming in saying it's not actually working that way. Um, and if we could promote Georgia, I know she would so like. Let somebody tell us yeah, exactly what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So, 
that. Let me get her in here. All right, Georgia, and, you should be all set. Oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can. Thanks, Georgia. All right. Um, so I'm sitting here incredibly frustrated and angry um, because it feels like what is being said is not my experience, it's not the parents' experience, and it's not what providers are experiencing. And so it feels like we're living in, two, we're existing in two universe, right? And I, we're here together. So let us know, what are you experiencing, Georgia? So we're not experiencing seven to eight weeks waiting list time. We are not experiencing DCF approving um, these PPAs and the, the, the Care for Kids application. So in my experience, we submit or the parents submit on their own the Care for Kids application outside of a DCF process. And we don't see any DCF process for approval. We have not been instructed on going through an approval process. We have just been told, just submit the PPA to Care for Kids and that's it. Um, so I'm imagining that there are cases where Francesca has raised the issue that because Care for DCF is not stamping or approving those certificate, whatever that process is supposed to look like, providers are not being paid their full rates if it goes over the amount. I have received certificate where DCF parents certificate are being canceled because the reason is they're not in an approved work situation. We have had DCF families wait in for months to be approved because again, they have had missing information sent out for work information, um, for certain types of IDs and stuff. And so we are not experienced. And when those missing information gets submitted, then those parents are being placed back in a processing mode. And there is confusion around when people are taken off the waiting list, what exactly does that mean? Because if you're taken off the waiting list, um, first of all, if you get the application, is there is there a review process or people just automatically placed on the waiting list? And when they're taken off the waiting list, does that mean that um, they're on the waiting list because they passed a preliminary approval process that says that they would be eligible for the program, but they're being placed on the waiting list, which would be an important process so that if someone says to us, I'm placed on the waiting list, we can, we can probably say to a parent, okay, when you get off the waiting list, because there's some initial eligibility review and assessment, then even if you're going through the process again, there is some sense that you will be approved for the program. But we, we, it, we, it just feels so nebulous out there that we don't even know how to guide and assist parents. And we're being told, well, this is how the system should be working, but that is not what we're experiencing on the ground. And I don't know if I'm clear um, but it's it's just so nebulous and it's so unwieldy that I can't even support parents in, in helping them to understand what they're supposed to do. So can somebody address George's point number one about DCF needing to submit job information? Uh, it's not automatic eligibility or that's something they have to submit. They that should not be happening. They should not be requesting work or activity Where would that information. Be Where would that be happening in the system? Um, that would, if that is actually happening, that would be by notification from Care for Kids to the provider that they need work activity. Um, can I? Can we just take it once? There was a lot in, sure. in that. Yep. So can we yep. just do sure. one at a time? So. Um, First, Georgia, I want to address the seven to eight week comment that you made on the wait list. So that could that could be true if because the way that the wait list is prioritized, it's by priority group. So um, you might hear us refer to priority group four, eight, nine, ten, um, things like that. But I want to be clear that as I said before, families 
who are working making less than 60% SMI are those who come off first. If there are families who are in you know, workforce training activities, higher education, GED programs, unfortunately those priority groups are eight, nine, 10. So those would come after anybody working, making less than 60% SMI. Um, it's a barrier in our, our statute that we're trying to kind of work through in terms of policy, but that is it, that could be true. So if the parent is in higher education, workforce, GED, adult ed programs, um, they may not, they, they will probably experience a wait that is longer than seven to eight weeks. But if they're working, making less than 60% SMI, um, then they should not experience that wait time. And I would um, su suggest that you guys reach out to Care for Kids specifically with that specific family information. Um, and the processing times for wait list are listed and are accurate on the United Way or on the Care for Kids website. So I would use that as a, as a reference for point in time. So Kristen, um, I can yes. tell you right now, I have two families that I can think of off the top of my head whose information we submitted in December and they're still waiting to go through a process. So when and you so say you submitted their information, I just want a little bit more information, Georgia, from you to understand kind of where these things are happening. So this was a family that was on the wait list? So this was a family that applied and has been, one was placed on the waiting list. Mm -hmm. One was missing information when she came up for a review. And we submitted the missing information notice within a 14 day period because that family was, um, her case was discontinued because of a missing information. We submitted the missing information within a certain period of time. Correct, yeah. And that family, case she it appears that that family is now being placed at the back of the line based on when the missing information came in we have a parent who applied for care for kids and was placed on the waiting list and i believe in december and i believe they may have been brought off the waiting list but i'm not 100 percent sure if they're still on the waiting list but again at this point that parent is still, I may still be on the waiting list and they applied in December. And so when you make a statement that says the waiting list is seven to eight weeks, it feels disconnected from what our experience is. And it may very well be that because of the different categories that parents are in, we don't know what categories parents fall in when they apply. So it feels very disconnected. And sometimes it feels disingenuous when people are saying seven to eight weeks, when that's not our experience on the ground. So I would basically change that statement because it feels on the ground like we are not being told the truth about what our experience is when we say seven to eight weeks. And it may simply just be that the parents we're serving aren't necessarily falling within those categories. Understood. And I, I, completely, you know, I appreciate that comment because you're right. And maybe this is an area of opportunity for us for better communication in terms of, okay, if you are placed on the wait list and you are in one of those other priority groups that may not be prioritized in the next seven to eight weeks, then we need to be clear about that. So I can definitely appreciate that. And I think that there's, that's an area of opportunity for us for better communication. So thank you for that. Thank you. And the final think, thing I would say is we really need DCF to come on because they're also the other um, clog in this in this because we don't find that um, DCF is and I just got a text from a provider. They're not approving these applications. And so there are applications that are going into DC into care for kids from DCF that has no approval process. Okay, so, and then this is the other question, I think that kind of came up too in, in the original is the process for which applications for DCF are submitted. Um, so Laura did touch on it a little bit, but the in order for DCF to approve the rate um, that they are willing to pay for the childcare payments, um, they need for their own like audit purposes on their end, they need to 
approve those rates prior to. So the process that was created with them was that they would be the ones to submit the applications to Care for Kids with that stamp. Now, that said, I know that there have been difficulties with the stamp and how things are being sent to United Way um, from DCF. And we do meet with them on a weekly basis and are working through some of those processing um, barriers that we're experiencing. And listening to things like this is very helpful for us because these are all things that we can elevate on those calls with DCF. I was very hopeful that that Ted would make it on today, but, um, and I apologize about that. I was very excited to be able to show the partnership between the three of us, but um, they are also doing their best to understand a system that they don't have a lot of knowledge about. So every week we're all learning something new about each other in the process. So we will elevate that. It has been brought up, um, I think weekly, and I'm sure Sherry can, can attest to that, but on our calls with DCF specifically about the stamp, things are not coming in with the stamp. Parents, because they have the experience and the history of being the ones to submit the applications are having a hard time with this transition where they think that they still have to submit the application. Um, well, it's faster if I just submit it because I can't get in touch with my DCF worker. Uh, so those are all things that, that we're trying to work through. But right now the process is that DCF is the entity to um, submit the application to Care for Kids to, and the hope is that eventually it will expedite the process. And, you know, with any change, there are some growing pains that we're trying to work through. But uh, Laura, I see that you came off mute. Is there something that you wanted to add? Well, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, Georgia, thank you for sharing all that information. And I think it would be important for the Care for Kids team to talk a little bit about the DCF partnership, because Kristen is right. These, this, the case of the stamping of the application has been a little bit of a problem. Um, but I know that they are trying to address it. So I would ask one of the Sherry's to speak to that because I think they are starting to make headway and they are in direct communication with the casework or with the, with the staff at DCF who processes the fiscal portion of it. So I would just ask if they could address that, that would be helpful. Meryl, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, I think one of the issues here is that for a parent, I apply and I'm told I'm put on a wait list. Um, there's the wait list and then there's the processing time after you've been taken off the wait list. And so what we're hearing, you know, it it's always going to be more than six to eight weeks where people get put on the wait list because there's the processing time after they get taken off the wait list. The, the issue is that people don't associate those as being different time frames. It's all just the time that I'm waiting to get a care for kids certificate. Um, and I, I think that's exactly right, Meryl. I think that it's almost like we need a metric for that. So providers know exactly how long they're going to wait because if parents can't afford to pay, then the provider often can't afford to take the child. And then care for kids families might be left out of an opening because by the time they get through the process, the spot is yeah. gone. And then you end up with parents at the higher end being able to afford while they wait. So really what matters to providers is the overall wait. I think the second number that matters if I'm a provider is when do you look back to? And so I know we've said it, but like, you know, Sherry, a, 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 a person comes off the wait list now they're processing. Does their child care payment go back to the date at which processing started or go back to when you have all the materials or how do you- The invite date. The, the invite. invite off the wait list. Right. So then if we could have the average time processing plus the average time on the wait list and then from invite to enroll, you know, to- in, I think that's what providers need. If we have a way of having on our dashboard that kind of information, and maybe we do, but people need to know where to find that because they're trying to plan for the family and their program and they can only wait so long without filling that spot to pay their staff. 
Exactly, Beth. And I would say as of what I presented this morning, and again, <clears throat> providers may not have experienced that yet because we've made so much progress in the past month. You know, it, so if they were, if they have a historical experience beyond that, if we show today that the first time we're touching applications, typical PG4s is somewhere between four to five weeks as of today, you can then assume they're going to be placed on the wait list. Now we're going to add the six to eight weeks time they're on the wait list. So you're already adding that four to five to the six to eight, and then they're invited off. And then probably gonna be another two weeks before we resume processing those. So right then and there are all your timelines to add together as of today. And just to be realistic, I think, cause um, this is also a call where people try to think about other things like big picture advocacy. What we have to understand is we've gone from 15,000 to more than 19,000 children on care for kids. The current budget that we are living in for next fiscal year, so for July 1st, calls for us to get to 18,500 spaces. So that would extend the wait list if we have to start to ratchet down from 19,400 to 18,500. The governor's budget proposal proposes going to 20,000 150 children, which would allow the program to stay open, uh, which would, the program's going to stay open, which would allow the wait list to be at its current status for, you know, what Sherry just described. But if the governor's budget doesn't pass and we don't get the additional resources, then we're ratcheting down to 18.5 and we are going sticking at 60% of SMI. So just to, to be clear, enough money passed in the two-year budget to fund care for kids for 18,500 in fiscal year 25, which starts July 1st. We are now at 19,400. It might be a little different. No one has to correct me because it's in that range. I saw a number end of last week. Um, so we would have to reduce our enrollment by a thousand children right now starting July 1st, which would the wait list would do that slowly. As people left Care for Kids, others would be let on, but at a slower pace than we're able to let families on now. So I just think it's important to keep in mind that we're in a very unusual time in my whole time in early childhood to have Care for Kids stay open for this length of time and just keep taking children is unusual. Um, COVID, Funding helped us, and now we have some state and federal funds that we're using. Um, but just, I just wanted to be clear about that. But can I just come back to Georgia's um, uh, reality versus what we're seeing? Um, how how can because I'm seeing other people say I agree. I'm having the same experience. What should people do um, if they're feeling like? I, I've i done everything we're supposed to do, and this is still a problem. Who should they contact Sherry at United Way to say, help? And, and what are the call wait times right now? I think both of those things will probably be important to people. Um, the call wait times, I don't have those right in front of me. Sorry, I have different screens up. Um, okay. Mondays are always our highest. Um, it's very challenging to respond to a question without any detail. So what I typically offer on this call is for any providers on this call, they email me directly. If typically first go through your provider liaison and they are very responsive and um, I hear nothing but amazing feedback about them. But if there's anything that you feel is not working the way we just discussed it today um, on the Care for Kids end, um, then if you email me directly, um, and I will put my email in the chat. A lot of you have done that before. Um, I always have someone look right into it and that's where we identify any issues or challenges. Um, and then also unpack and uncover if there is maybe a um, misperception between the parent and the provider. Maybe the information they're presenting to the provider is different than what um, the Care for Kids program is receiving. Um, we can also let you know whether, um, you know, we're waiting on DCF um, to follow up on something, but I just put my and, my email in the chat. 
And is it possible, I don't know what's happened with DCF because of the technology, but we could offer to come back with DCF next week or the week after when they're available to answer specific questions as well, um, because they were supposed to be part of this presentation. That's added a lot of challenges to the system, but something that we think um, is a really important sort of social equity issue uh, for families and for providers because of the way the payments were going. But as we launch it, it doesn't feel that much better, but I think ultimately it's gonna be much better. And also Commissioner Bayan and Laura, you had asked about this a little bit earlier. Um, when we are getting, again, it, it has been, um, I know DCF did outreach to all the parents um, that they work with and all the providers they work with, letting them know about the new process. And as we suspected, parents were used to submitting their renewals and their applications and, and supporting documentation and providers to the Care for Kids program directly. We have now started when we're getting information in from providers on parents, sending it over to DCF because it did not come in via DCF. And now we're, we're following up with them just saying, hey, you know, what's going on with these 50 families? We received it directly from the provider of the family, but not from you. Can you go ahead and approve these and send that back to us? And it is, I think, a learning curve for DCF. And, you know, they have a lot of regional offices, unlike us, you know, where we're centralized. So um, every week we notice that we're getting fewer and fewer and DCF is turning around the documents to us more quickly. Um, you know, we can't um, do the approvals for DCF, but if you want to... Um, let us know if you have a problem with the DCF case. I will also escalate that for you. Okay. So Izzy, let us know if 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 providers want to hear from DCF. We'll come back with them next week or the week after. Oh, I, I can I can promise they do. Okay. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> okay. So um Julie and Kristen, I just asked you to reach out to Ted and say, not sure what happened today, but we'll reschedule for one of the next two Mondays, depending on your calendar, Izzy. Great, great, yeah, and we can we can do that behind the scenes. Ava, you've had your hand up for a while. I want to give you a chance to ask a question. I just want to point out really quickly that Sherry Sotera's email is unitedway.org, and I reposted it on the chat. But I wanted to um, lift up some of the Spanish speaker questions and comments here. I know Annabelle, um, you made various comments about how long extremely long the wait times were. So thank you for, for sharing your comments and feedback. Another common feedback here was from Sonia Nunez Colón, and it, it's not pertinent, pertinent to today's conversation, but I wanted to give her a response. Sonia, in regards to why Care for Kids does not allow children over the age of 13 um, it's federal and state statute. They're just regulations that children who are older, the age of 13, who are not of special needs, are not mandated to be in a care uh, setting. You know, parents can make the decision based on their own, the child's maturity as to how long they can be left alone, et cetera. So that's why they, they're not part of the care for kids category. Just wanted to give you an answer there because I'm sure you were wondering. And then another question that we had here, comment question from Lilian Echevarria. She just wanted a little bit more clarity. And I know we're going to table the DCF conversation for another day, but she just wanted a little bit more clarity about payments and invoices. So uh, even though we're not going to answer that right now, I wanted to you know, lift up the fact that there are concerns. Some Spanish speakers here are looking for more answers. Um, a curiosity that I had uh, just about going back to the care for kids portion of this conversation. Um, when do you expect, I know in the beginning of the presentation today, you had some timelines and talked about uh, when the wait list will hopefully dissipate. Uh, when do you expect, again, if you can repeat for those who jumped on a little later, for things to be a little bit better? <laughs> well, I, I I would say barring significant additional dollars, we don't anticipate the wait list to go away. It's a way that we manage enrollment. Um, and again, like if we just let, if we had no wait list and we just brought folks in period, I'm sure we'd be up to 24,000 kids on care for kids within 18 months. You know, it keeps growing. It's like, there's a large need for childcare 
So I do think the wait list is going to be my, my read on it. I'm not in charge of the final budget that passes is that there's going to be an ongoing wait list. And I know people might not like that, but I will tell you as a former legislator, before we had a wait list, the program would just close. So we'd be on this call today saying, oh, we're at 19,500, the program's closing. And that would be that. And then what happens is then families don't think of it as something that's gonna help them. And, and the, whole, the whole system really breaks down. And, and the other good thing about having a wait list is when we go and say, we wanna add higher education and workforce training, it used to be no, because there was no mechanism to you know, somehow control the number of children on Care for Kids. And now you know, that's, that's been allowed. Um, I will say that we had to provide data to the Appropriations Committee last week, and we did the data over the past six years. Still, um, more than 97% of the families who are enrolled in care for kids live below 50% of the state median income. So it continues to be a program that's serving mostly families below, the vast majority are families below 50% of the state median income, even as we increase to 60 and potentially 65% of SMI. So I just don't wanna give false hope that somehow the, the waiting list is going away because the only way the waiting list goes away is if we have sort of unlimited funds for care for kids to allow to keep growing the programs. We grew from 15,000 to 20,000 quite easily um, in 2020 and 2021. So we know it would just keep growing with no wait list. And, you know, at approaching $1,000 a child, that yep. there's just it's a limit. I think it's 10,000 a child, not 1,000. At 10,000, yeah. yeah. And sorry, 10,000 a child, it just, it, well, it's 9,000, it's like 8,900 or something. Am I right, um, Kristen? I just looked at it. It's like $8,900 a child a year. That just adds up. Mm -hmm. So- I'll stop there, but just yeah. so people have context about the waiting list, the only way to get rid of it is to have sort of way more funding. <laughs> Which, of course, is exactly what we all would really like to see happen, and I'm sure you all would as well. Um, so everyone should not forget to always be um, pushing pushing for that. That's the most important thing we could do. Um, Ava, were you finished with your line of questioning? Yes. Okay, Meryl, you had your hand up. I'm going to turn yeah. to you. I had a question about whether it would be possible to have at, at a sort of system level, have DCF uh, and Care for Kids cross-reference your lists to see, are there active foster parents who've, who are enrolled in Care for Kids who should be getting um, paid for through, it, that it should be considered a DCF family as opposed to a regular Care for Kids family. And therefore, maybe there should be if DCF is willing to pay for it at a higher rate for those places where childcare costs more than the um, the regular care for kids rate, just kind of. Hi, yeah, Meryl. Um, all the families um, that are in care for kids that are meet the DCF criteria, actually, when they became eligible for care for kids, was done so based on their DCF eligibility because it's a family of one. So. Um, we already did sync up the list. So um, someone two years ago that was on Care for Kids was already uh, flagged as a DCF family and DCF was paying any above and beyond fees outside of the Care for Kids knowledge uh, of what they were paying them. So um, we already know the children were already appropriately coded as DCF. Um, we just now need to transition over any payments DCF was already making in with the Care for Kids payment. So, and that's how we were able to automate um, onboarding the DCF families with the new process because they were already identified as such. So, but it, but it did sound like there were families who thought they were supposed to apply themselves as opposed to going through DCF. And they're, they are DCF families, but they're, they submitted their application on their own sort of a way to catch those. Is what yes. The, well, historically, they did apply for Care for Kids, for the Care for Kids subsidy directly. The parents did. 
usually in conjunction with the provider. Whether the parent did it on their own, they were always coded as DCF because that's how their eligibility was granted. Now, everything needs to come through DCF. And I think that's where the learning curve uh, challenge is that families and providers now need to understand that um, everything has to go to the DCF worker and then they approve it and send it to us. But once they do, there should actually be very little communication between Care for Kids and the family since DCF does all the eligibility verification and just approves it, sends it to us and says, good to go. This is how much they can receive. Okay. Um, there have been a bunch of questions in the chat about um, redetermination issues. And that's, you know, obviously for a provider, a really big problem if redetermination goes on and on and on, because typically the parent is still paying what they were paying, their copay. And if they then get determined three or four months later as not being eligible, um, the, typically the provider ends up being out a lot of money. Um, Absolutely, Meryl. And when you see um, in the, the processing guidelines I, I put out this morning, where we've made that huge progress and we'll continue to collapse that time frame. Again, in December, we were working at renewals that were two months out, which is not a good place to be. And now we're uh, finishing up those that are expiring at the end of February. So um, shortly we will be current in the same exact month. So I agree with you. So I, I completely expect those renewal issues to pretty much dissipate within the next month. And we'll know in five weeks when we come back on if that's true. So we'll yep. all come back in five weeks. Um, and and I think, um, Julie, I don't know if it's you or Sherry. Um, is there a way to share a link to a dashboard or do we have it? I know we were working on a dashboard. Is there a dashboard available for providers now that we could share? Yeah, Sherry, can we put the link in of what you currently post on the Care for Kids website as far as processing times? Oh, yep. Great. Uh, so listen, there's there's always um, there's a ton of, of of changes that can be made uh, internally for, um, you know, can the system have this box? Can it have that thing? There's all these things you yeah. can do within what you've got. And then there is what you need. And so there's a question here and I'm going to send it to you, Commissioner. Do you foresee any of this changing if the blue ribbon panel recommendations are passed by the legislature? And what is the relationship between the problems we've discussed today and some of the, of both the recommendations, but of course this is a legislative pass, right? It has to pass through the legislature. Um, so there's an advocacy piece here for all of us listening to the answer. Um, but I guess, can you just help us understand the relationship sure. between those I, two things? I, I appreciate that question. I think. What became clear during our listening session is that our processes could be better and our user interface and technology could be better and sharing information like the dashboard, et cetera. And so we are focusing on that with some federal funds based on the Blue Ribbon panel plan. Um, the plan also calls to significantly increase funding over five years here, but to get the systems working better first. And so sessions like the, like this help us see there's some disconnects going on that we need to address. Um, in the legislature, what's before the legislature is um, the funding for care for kids. Um, the other thing uh, that's in the Blue Ribbon Panel Plan um, was to try to get parent co-pays to 7%, and we're working toward that because that's a new federal rule as well. So there's also um, work like that going on. Things that don't need the legislature, um, we're working on it as well, uh, like the systems uh, working with United Way to improve processing times, looking at the staffing, applying federal and state dollars to, to maximize. Um, the expansion of Care for Kids was directly linked to the Blue Room Panel Plan. So we're talking very specifically about Care for Kids here. And Care for Kids is a critical part of our system. So, you know, and it also asked us to look at groups like homeless, et cetera. Like that's a big, it's a big change for the program that people have wanted for 15 years to have eligibility for families who are homeless. So there are things, and, and, and the same with we heard a lot about the DCF payments being a problem over the Blue Ribbon Panel Plan, and we're looking to move that into a single system, which is also a, 
it's, it doesn't seem like a big thing, but it's a huge technology and uh, change of thinking and shift uh, to do that. So those are just some things, um, but you know we can be better. And I think what I learned through the Bloomberg panel process is the more we are out there and listening, the more we sort of know what's going on on the ground and can help. Like the comments today about, okay, this is what you're saying, but that's not what I'm seeing, which is leads me to say, well, then we got to come back in a month. Yeah. If we're saying things are better than certainly in a month, yeah. uh, what we're saying should align. Um, and I know there have been some improvements, process improvements at United Way, and they're always looking to improve processes, as are we. So, um, but there is improved technology, getting more parents to do online applications that sort of require everything to be there before it comes in. Then the workers aren't spending all their time chasing down pieces of paper and pay stubs. They're processing applications that come in with everything complete. I think that all helps. Right. Um, all right. So final co co few comments I'll just make. Um, you know, the, the, there's obviously a trickle here when this is backed up. It's then risky business decisions for for the centers trying to kind of hold the hold this all up. Um, we've got, you know, families who are uh, experiencing homelessness in one particular situation. We've got, um, you know, processing times, meaning that people can't get jobs. This is sort of a, a one thing leads to another kind of problem. And I just want to make sure that all of the comments that can help us understand how robust and far reaching these issues actually are, um, that that gets noticed. Um, all of the questions uh, and all of the comments in the chat will all get forwarded on uh, to Commissioner Bai and team. So um, anything that wasn't able to be answered here uh, will be at least passed on. I know there's too much for us to, to say. There's probably some of you who think that we don't ask hard enough questions. There's some of you who are probably uncomfortable at the hard questions we answer. Let me say that I'm grateful to folks like Georgia who can come on and really give us what's happening on the ground. I'm not in the center. I'm just trying to process all these you know, questions and chats as they come in. Uh, I love what Dawn says here. Uh, it's encouraging to hear all the partners at the table working to streamline payments and systems. Please remember programs are still struggling each day receiving all payments in a timely manner is imperative. And exactly, I mean, the, the there's problems and also, thank goodness, you all are at the table and thank goodness all of our folks are here uh, watching and participating. So that's just a call to keep it going. Um, we have an April 8th listening session, I think tentatively scheduled. Um, so we should be having, hopefully, DCF on in the next few weeks. We should have a listening session in early April. Uh, we should have maybe two or three weeks after that, uh, check back in on this. So we've got a couple of things on the horizon for you all to come back for. Um, and then a reminder, of course, that um, the morning without childcare is April 3rd. And that is the time also to send a, a sort of big message to the state about the urgency of this, because as you can see, we all can't agree on all these weeds to expect uh, your average person, maybe who doesn't even have children to understand this, I think is a tall ask. So we need to get this kind of out in the public sphere. So um, I think that's, let's say Ava, I'm gonna give you um, you and Meryl just one quick second to talk about next week's testimony. But before this that, uh, excuse me, this week's testimony. But before I do that, let me just thank um, everyone who was our guest today. Uh, we so appreciate you being here. We look forward to seeing you a few times in the next month. Um, yeah. and, uh, and you'll be getting all these. We appreciate you. Chats we from really, us. really appreciate this time and we have to do better and we're going to do better and you can hold us accountable. We'll come back. Thank you. Thanks so much. And, um, folks, please stay on because this testimony is important. So listen up. All right. Uh, Ava, I'll let, actually, uh, Marilyn and Ava, you guys can just kind of tag team this. Yeah, very quickly. We had close to 300 people on this call today with over six 60 different questions and all of these comments and questions are are phenomenal but they can even be even more phenomenal if everyone here paying attention and maybe watching this recording later on can also testify so there are legislative hearings that are happening this week i'll let meryl talk to that but in um, reference to where to go and how to testify we do have a youtube channel on behalf of 
Childcare for Connecticut's Future. Uh, you can find the YouTube channel by the handle Child Care for CT. That's Child Care F-O-R-C-T. Check out the YouTube channel. There's a tutorial of how to testify and you know how, how you can navigate our testimony builder as well as our website. But I'll pass it to Meryl to talk about the legislative hearings that are happening. Okay, this is a very busy week of hearings. Um, the Education Committee has a hearing on Wednesday. Um, there are two bills on early childhood. One is um, a bill that has Senate Bill uh, 286 has got three sections, one of which mandates increasing uh, wages for early educators. Um, what's missing is some money to pay for it. Um, the second piece would uh, make care for kids um, available to all early educators um, without a parent copay. Um, and then the third is about the child care incubator. There is also in a different committee, at the Commerce Committee tomorrow, a hearing about a child care incubator bill to allow the expansion of family child care incubators to more communities. Um, and then there is also on Wednesday, um, a bill about um, uh, in the finance committee bills about um, creating the um, a child tax credit and um, raising revenue by increasing the um, highest tax bracket so that um, the super rich are paying more into uh, the general fund. Um, There'll be stuff on the listserv, the ECE info listserv, um, about how to testify, how to submit information, uh, how to submit testimony, how to sign up to testify, um, and that should go out sometime before noon today. Um, David, do you have a? Does the child care campaign have a, a testimony builder for this yet? Um, we should same same timeline, maybe Meryl. Izzy and I, we can connect after this so we can have, like you said, yeah. before noon. Yep. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. And folks, you can join the ECE list server. I actually was just looking for the link and I couldn't find it. I don't know, Errol, uh, Meryl, if you can pop it in or not. Uh, see if I can pop it in there. The other, there is also one other bill that I wanted to mention, which is that um, the Human Services Committee is considering a bill to um, make uh, diapers eligible for Medicaid coverage under Medicaid for um, kids with certain medical conditions. So, um, you know, I know that that is frequently a problem with uh, families not being able to afford diapers uh, when they're in care. Um, and so that's another opportunity to let your, make your voice heard. Um, and I'm trying to find the EC info uh, subscribe list. Hey, well, uh, you can, uh, Hang yeah, on. I'll stick it here, right here. Hang on just a second. Most people I think here are probably on the ECE list. But probably, yeah. but let me just make right sure. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, let's see, do we, I don't think we have a, um, our next week topic is not 100% yet. We're always waiting to confirm things, um, but we will put that out, of course, um, as usual. Um, as you heard, we have a busy month and a half um, and it is testimony time. So we'll be sharing out the the quick five minute things you can do and the kind of bigger half hour things you can do. Um, but please keep these in mind. They are very important to getting things moving this session. Ava. Uh, Meryl, uh, John just asked if the education committee um, hearing the bill will also create the fund that falls outside of the spending cap that's on the Q&A. Yeah, yeah. That's their, their version of that bill is there. There will be one in the finance committee as well. And then I answered in the Q&A, someone just asked about the hearing about EC teachers and care for kids. And I answered yes. So yes, one of the bills being proposed um, by the Early Childhood Alliance, Merrill's group, um, is to allow early care education workforce uh, who qualify under care for kids um, and who are part of the workforce to qualify for free child care. But Mayor, if you want to dig a little deeper on that, because people were asking questions and I just answered okay. yes. Yep. So it's section two of Senate Bill 286. Um, it uh, is a copy of what Kentucky did, essentially making child care free for early educators as a um, way to 
help get some more people into the workforce and to retain early educators. Um, essentially, it would be childcare with no copay for anybody working more than 20 hours a week as a early educator. Uh, still has to pass, so it's, don't count on it yet. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to Sandra for providing interpretation for us this morning. Thank you, of course, to uh, to our usual experts and to all of our amazing one-time guests uh, or special guests today. Um, they'll be back. Um, and thank you, of course, to you for providing all of the questions, the comments, and the eyes and ears that make all of this worth bothering with. Have a wonderful week, and we will see you all back here next Monday.